so welcome Turtle. Um, just to do a little bit of an introduction, and I'm sure you hardly need one, but I'm with uh, Turtle Bunbury today, the author of this fine book here, uh, Ireland's Forgotten Past, which is, has been said in the uh, Guardian as delicious by none other than Sebastian Barry, one of the, our greatest writers. So I am sure we have, will have a good bit of chat tonight about what is in a few of these pages. Um, Turtle, obviously we're going to be directing people towards uh, to buy place at the end of the thing but we will have to say uh, how are you first and foremost I am very well thank you very much all good of, uh, of a Monday evening <laughs> and uh, yes it's it's we're obviously in lockdown and everybody's looking for something to read so this is obviously the perfect time to be talking to an author um, this isn't just a book about one story this is a overarching theme about Ireland's forgotten past but there are so many stories in here it's rather difficult to fi figure out where to start. Um, obviously my personal interest is in that sort of medieval era, the great medieval era of uh, the 10th, 11th and 12th centuries but I mean how on earth do you put it Irish history into you know a, a, a book? How do, you, how do you bring it down to this size of a book first and foremost? Well, I mean, that was the challenge. It was always going to be a skinny book, a skinny history of Ireland of sorts. I mean, obviously, um, it doesn't tell the entire history of Ireland because uh, you need a very, very big book for that. But um, it was trying to find stories that are slightly less well known. Um, and from my perspective, it was a kind of really good excuse for me to go back and look at stuff that I didn't really know very much about, because it's very exciting from a historian's point of view, you know, the research itself is sometimes the most, uh, you know, tantalizing part of it. So quite a few of the early chapters are looking at um, things like uh, the Mesolithic and Neolithic and Bronze Age stuff, which I didn't really know very much about. And I ended up communicating with a lot of archeologists trying to build up that because I'm where I live I'm surrounded by you know dolmens and stone circles and, and all that stuff so I really wanted to get an insight into what that was all about so that's why I mean the, the you know it begins uh, many thousands of years ago my book you know it starts with uh, the first humans here apparently about 10,000 years ago so um, there was a lot to cover <laughs> <laughs> there certainly was that. and and um, so well I mean honestly the, uh, the 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 first few chapters of just this you know, Pangea, uh, this idea of it, it, it starts in a lovely place and you go zoom through it quite well, you know, first hundred or so thousand years uh, <laughs> till yeah. we get to, till we get to the, the sort of the prehistoric uh, Ireland and, and we, you know, the, the, the pre-Christian Ireland as well. Um, was there any uh, sort of uh, pressure of you to uh, concentrate on uh, volume one, volume two? Is that something we can maybe look forward to? In the well, there wasn't, but actually I started to think that as I wrote the book, I was like, God, maybe I should be looking, looking at it this way. Um, and definitely the, the first part of the book is very chronological and right up to, um, well, there's a bit of a gap where I didn't take on the sort of Celtic era, if you will, um, as much, I mean, I, I took on aspects of it, um, but uh, there was a sort of natural chronology that was starting to take shape, but that would have been writing the history of Ireland. And, you know, uh, that's not what I had set out to do, but there were, you know, there were then, uh, in the chronology there were chapters about you know Ireland in the age of the Romans even though obviously Ireland wasn't uh, conquered by the Romans or anything but the Roman age had a massive impact on the country so uh, I wanted to look at that for instance. And I suppose that the, 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 the style that it takes is this little you, start, you know the, the vignette idea where you have a little uh, opening into an era and then you can sort of talk around it a little bit better. Um, uh, obviously with Citric Silkbeard, who I think may be one of my favorite people in history, uh, he just is never says die, and never says die. And, um, <laughs> you know, with Citric Silkbeard, you can talk about a little bit of Brian Brew, a little bit of Malachy or Malchocknail of Meath, and it just brings this whole era to life. Is that really what the book is sort of, it aims to do? Well, that was, life? I mean, he was, he was particularly good, as you say. I mean, if he was in a, a, a series on um, the Vikings, he's going to be there from episode one all the way through till season seven, because as you say, he just doesn't go on. He's, he, he's king for 46 years, isn't he? <laughs> king of government for 46 years, which is incredibly impressive in that time, you know. And comes to um, it as a young man as well. And uh, yeah, he's, he, somehow he managed to go through uh, Brian Brew's sort of warring on the northern borders. He's got uh, his mother, <laughs> to say the least, although that may be a different story. And um, yeah, he is such this factionalized sort of state of Dublin and sort of at a very uh, important time in its history as well. Yeah, and I think there's still, you know, plenty, funnily enough, more to come out about Citric's reign. I, th I think uh, I'm right in saying, and particularly in relation to Christchurch Cathedral, which he founded on his watch. 
Um, so he uh, became king. When did when did he become king? Do I actually have? Nine eighty, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, he, he he does a series of things. He founds the first mint uh, in Ireland's first mint in Dublin. Uh, he sets in motion really um, the the stone walls. Um, the, there, there was a sort of embankment around the city, as far as I can work out, and he started on his watch. It becomes a stone wall because he needs to keep people out. People keep invading the city. In fact, uh, his father had lost the throne when uh, the city had been invaded um, by the king of Leinster, I think, or maybe it's the high king. It might oh. be me. Yeah, it, there's so, there, it, with alarming regularity, everyone could say that's for sure. The um, I suppose in that this is the the real crux time for for Dublin itself, as you say, it's it's changing from from presumably slightly pagan roots to towards Christianity again with Christchurch Cathedral. It's also getting much bigger. Its importance it has sort of taken over, I think, from that Tara where it's become the the must the must have for any uh, ambitious king. You know, he they they have to swing through and, and take it. Um, mm. I mean, it it really is a, a, an extraordinary time. Um, I was interested, obviously, in the uh, when you're talking about uh, that there, there was actually a connection to Wales as well through Citric Silkbeard's um, later reign, um, and his daughter, I think, married into one of the dynasties over there. That's right, and then he'd, he'd also have a, a colony, basically. A colony was set up from Dublin in Wales, in Gwynedd, um, uh, which is where they found uh, a, a number of the coins that were minted at his, at his mint. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's no great that the two, uh, you know, these two areas should be linked to one another. Um, but it's all part of, I suppose, that Viking network that runs, you know, all the way up, all the way to, you know, to Norway, you know, going up the Hebrides and the Orkneys and the, the whole Scottish coast. It's all part of this thing. And I think it was very interesting that just before lockdown, um, I haven't seen the full results of it yet, but the, this um, archaeological dig where they, uh, up by Ship Street, just near mm -hmm. Dublin Castle, uh, and they think that they've, they found uh, sort of evidence that the black, uh, the black pool, the Dove Lynn, uh, had room oh, for, you know, maybe 200 ships. Holy um, they think it's a lot, lot bigger than it had hitherto been thought, put it that way. Yeah, I mean, this is, the, this is what we struggle to sort of see, you know, when we see the metropolis that it is today, we, we sort of I presume a very, uh, you know, city of, of, of what, uh, several thousand people, presumably at this, even at this time at its height under the Vikings. Um, mm. could have supported, you know, 200 ships in, a, in, a, in the Poddle River. <laughs> it's, I know, uh, it's amazing. So this is what I'm saying, that hopefully, you know, more and more of these unexpected clues, that was, that's a 2020 discovery. You know, yeah. this is the joy of, uh, of history, particularly with when archaeology comes, comes in behind it to back it up. Uh, because I think we've probably found most of the, uh, you know, the written sources. <laughs> but as I say, this, um, for instance, it looks like Citric Silkbeard went on a well. He went on a pilgrimage to Rome. He appears to have come back via Cologne and uh, in Germany. And there's a uh, you know growing um, evidence that he teamed up with the Irish Benedictine community, who were massive in Germany at this time. Uh, that he met with them there and discussed uh, this whole notion of setting up Christchurch. And it's suddenly you know you're stitched in from as far back as then into this sort of European project almost. It's incredible. Uh, it really is incredible. I, I just immediately go on then to the other European project of that sort of the next century, which is obviously the Knights Templar, which is another chapter in the book, and how yeah. we're, we become plugged into that vast network of, um, of, of money and religion. And uh, I, I mean, obviously, it's, that's from the, the, the early or the late 12th century, excuse me, and it brings in another fleet of newcomers, the Normans, my old buddies, the Normans. And um, a few big names appear in the name uh, or in the book. Uh, again, the, the disremembered I see in the front cover, that famous word. And it is a disremembered uh, association that we have in Ireland of all these temples here, there and everywhere. Um, it, it, that must have been an exciting chapter to write. It was, it was very exciting. I mean, obviously, the Knights Templar are always, you know, everybody, there's such uh, sort of excitement around the whole concept of the whole thing that actually I went into it quite cynically. <laughs> um, but uh, there turns out that there is, you know, lots of amazing links and stories and stuff. And, you know, and the fact is they were suppressed and, and, and uh, you know, a lot of the, the, the PR stories about them afterwards were, you know, pretty dark and so on. But there is no doubting, you know, we've got uh, Sir Walter de Riddlesford, um, who, may I say, was very memorably portrayed in your, <laughs> your own fine uh, work. Uh, well, and um, totally accurately, too. <laughs> 
completely accurately, yes. Um, <laughs> anyway, you know, he's, he's the, you know, the Grand Master of the Knights Templar in Ireland. He, he has his place not far from where I live at Kilkee Castle, mm. uh, near Castle Dermot, built by um, Hugh de Lacey, whose father is a Knight Templar, and, and de Lacey also builds um, uh, Clontarf Castle, you know. So, you know, it's, it's all part of this um, sort of network. And, but again, as you say, you know, that's a network that goes all the way across the Mediterranean into, into the Kingdom of Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. um, amazing, really. And, and again, it, 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 I know we talk about this, this forgotten past of Ireland, but I think that is a, another aspect of it that we don't realise how plugged into this European network we are. Um, even from our earliest times of, of, of before Citrix Hiltbeard and the, the arrival of the, the Vikings. But um, thankfully for uh, Walter and his, his lot, that they, the, the Irish Templars, they tended to do rather better than their French counterparts. They, uh, they uh, were treated a lot better. There weren't no burnings at the stake in this hand, but for one famous one later on in life. But um, mm. the, uh, the temple, the Templar, uh, there are temple places called temple around you in Carney, County Carlo. Was there a particular area there or down into Waterford, I think as well? Yeah, I mean, there was in Carlo, uh, well, I mean, there's a place called Ballon Temple that uh, would appear to be, it's sort of on the River Slaney mm. um, is, is one of the places, but yeah, particularly down, uh, in uh, Water Waterford, but uh, you know, all the way over to Sligo, this place, Temple House in in, um, in Sligo near Ballymote, right. uh, was their westernmost um, sort of headquarters. Um, and then, yeah, down in Wexford and County Louth, there's a massive presence there, but also, you know, in Kildare and Waterford. It's a bit like telling the weather forecast when you do this, but <laughs> <laughs> they were all over uh, that part of the world and down to uh, Passage East. The Hook Peninsula as well, of course, was, uh, you know, for a uh, long time, it was one of their uh, main bases. And uh, uh, yeah, I, I'm I'm so I'm sort of trying to get these uh, this, this this across the idea of how you know we are we you know I think Irish history is yet to make its, its sort of big splash on the on the scene of uh, in television and film. So hopefully at some stage mm. this sort of these sort of stories will be you know bigger and more well known. But you're bringing them to to light in such a lovely way. And as I say, the the one of the things I noticed throughout history of particularly in Ireland is this idea that women aren't treated uh, if they do appear in history, it's usually for rather negative light. Um, I mean, I've just, we were, I was sort of alluding to um, Richard Ladred, who was behind the burning of uh, Petronella of Midia uh, on behalf of, um, of her mistress. But one of the chapters which I adored was the, the, the mention of Rohizia de Verdon, who comes out of the pages of history, fully formed in my mind. And this just adds to that idea of this this lady who may or may not have been, you know, such a such a, a, a badass as she's portrayed other places, but mm. um, it's it's lovely to see a, a woman put to the front of history, find, you know, in this era when it wasn't all that common. No, it's really not. I mean, we have, you know, the the Aoife and and um, Isabel de Clare, maybe Isabel Marshall, those sort of uh, ladies, uh, slightly few and far between, though. And yet, for every Norman knight, there's a Norman lady, um, you know, and there are daughters and wives and mothers all over the place. Uh, and their story is very seldom told. But even with Rohisha, um, who built, the, she built this um, uh, castle just uh, near uh, Dundalk, like just northwest of Dundalk. Um, and it's a very dramatic castle. It's one of the uh, most uh, sort of epic ones I've seen in Ireland. Uh, it's sort of on a giant limestone outcrop uh, in the middle of what seems to be nowhere, but of course it wasn't nowhere. Back in those days, it was uh, the northern frontier between um, the Pale, the Anglo-Norman controlled Pale, and um, Ulster, the, the Gaelic kingdom of Ulster as it was. And she builds this fortress. It's certainly built uh, on her watch. I mean, she has no uh, husband as such at the time. Um, the uh, legend that uh, comes up afterwards, is, of course, is that uh, she said, uh, she put out a, a deal that she would, if somebody would build her a castle, she would marry them. And she's a very wealthy heiress. And that this gentleman, whose name is conveniently not known, um, apparently builds her this castle. And she brings him up. Um, to look at the incredible view from the banquet hall window and says, look at that, darling, isn't it wonderful? And as he looks out, she goes, Whoom, and uh, pushes him out to his doom. Um, so uh, I don't know whether that story is true. I longed for it to be true in a way because it's so cool. Um, or so, so, you know, sinisterly cool. Um, but uh, the evidence would suggest that uh, it's 
not that likely. And uh, maybe it was, you know, put, put out afterwards to paint her in a bad light. I don't know. Yeah. It's, it's an exceptional story. I, I love the fact, and obviously, you know, historical fiction being my thing, I would love to write that woman's story. She is a, a, a hoot and a half, I would say. Um, right. A similar area, which is one of the next stories, which is, again, one that I, I feel should be known much, much better and perhaps has been, elements have been taken for such things as Game of Thrones, I sort of, mm. I, I, is, is the story of Edward Bruce and his coming to Ireland with the Scots, the head of a mighty army ready to come down and uh, uh, find his, his throne. And I, I, it's an, it's, it is an incredible story. And if it wasn't true, you'd probably go, oh, come on, come on, this can't be true. And I, I mean, if you could tell us a little bit about Edward Bruce, you, I think I remember seeing a story where you had visited his grave. I did actually, yes. Well, yeah. I visited uh, part of his grave because <laughs> the man was beheaded and then quartered and, and parts of him were sent to the four corners of uh, the kingdom. Um, but uh, part of him is apparently there on the hill of Fochers uh, outside Dundalk. Uh, and it's, do you know what, it was, it was, I don't know whether it's really him or not, but I made sure that I felt like it was. And it was an extraordinary moment to, to, to feel that maybe, maybe inside this tomb is you know, this very uh, dramatic character from the annals of you know, medieval history. He is a younger brother of the famous Robert the Bruce, the, the, the man who had annihilated the um, English, the army of Edward II at the Battle of Bannockburn, you know, the most famous event in Scottish history, possibly. Um, and shortly after that, I mean, within months, I think, um, Robert the Bruce, now uh, King, King of uh, Scotland, sends Edward the Bruce to Ireland with, as you say, a huge army, 6,000 men, perhaps, um, to uh, basically to try and get the Scots-Irish alliance going. The idea is being to oust the Normans from both lands um, and uh, maybe to take in Wales while they're at it and basically to establish the Bruces as, uh, you know, as the winners of the Game of Thrones. They're going to be the guys who are in charge of these three kingdoms. It's going to be a pan-Gaelic Greater Scotia. That's the game plan. Um, it doesn't quite work out. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, to say the least. And it, it, but uh, oh yes, listen, I, I absolutely love that story as well. The, just the idea of having Robert the Bruce bumping around in Ireland. You know, one of the most famous people in British history, bumping around mm. here in 1317 as you know, younger brother, perhaps perhaps a little bit on edge of, of wondering what's going to happen. There's famine. There's Dublin in flames. There's uh, Norman lords fighting each other for the honour of being the leading them over rivers and red earls yeah. and and uh thank goodness for our two peoples <laughs> you know they, they we won the the, the bad guys victored <laughs> so uh the normans ended up uh taking the taking the uh the, the, the win that day um seemingly the won, but there was just so many twists and turns that's yeah. the thing and, and the, it is literally as you say because it is when they arrive in the scots army they suddenly end up in this sort of there's already lots of games in motion when they arrive and they yes they're one of the biggest and more powerful of the players but they're just another player in this strange uh you know not yeah civil war but there's a lot of different faction fighting and everything going on uh and it's quite exhausting throw in the famine as you mentioned that goes on and uh you know the famine is apparently so bad that people are starting to eat each other uh, according to the annals um so it's uh you know i'm very pleased that i wasn't alive in those times I think it would be the worst time to be alive. We've got the Black Death coming on its fast in its heels as well. Um, yeah. We've got yeah, witch trials and every witch, witchcraft trials and everything. And then, just to cap it off, uh, Prince Lionel, the thir the uh, second son of Edward the Third, arrives uh, with his des desire to stop uh, the Normans becoming more Irish than the Irish themselves. What That's right. Yes. <laughs> So he, he ends up um, moving to Carlo Castle, which is very close to where I live. Um, in uh, Well, the, the parts of the castle still survive two towers and uh, one of the curtain walls. The rest got uh, very dramatically um, knocked down. I'll maybe t tell that story mm -hmm. later. But um, yeah, I mean, the castle had been built by uh, the, the, one of the best known Normans, William Marshall. Um, uh, he'd, he'd whacked it up about uh, in about 1213 was the original um, formation of it, the, the great halls and bedrooms and chambers. And they, they, they've done quite a bit of study of it. So they, for example, the towers were where the bedrooms, the, the chambers were, and at least three of those chambers were had ensuite bathrooms. I always find that a nice little detail. Um, it's adding to its another, value, of course, so. <laughs> well, exactly. <laughs> 
um, uh, and then there was a, a prison in another of the uh, of the towers and so forth. Anyway, from Marshall, it it it, it passes down to his grandson, who's uh, Roger um, Bygod, um, the Earl of Norfolk, and it goes into the Earls of Norfolk. They do a lot of work on it, restoring and improving the castle over the years. Uh, then it goes to the Crown um, when the fifth Earl of Norfolk dies without an heir, and it goes to the Crown. Uh, and that's why Lionel of Antwerp, this guy, Prince, Prince Lionel, who's the son of Edward the um, Second, Edward the Third, um, uh, he is made uh, governor of Ireland and he comes across in the 1360s. Um, and he clearly took a shine to Carlo, oh, don't blame him at all. Um, and uh, he decided basically to relocate the exchequer um, from uh, the exchequer and then the, and then the court of common pleas or common bench as it is. Um, he brought them both down from Dublin Castle to Carlo because he felt it was a better place, securer place. They, he didn't have to deal with the O'Burns quite so much. <laughs> um, and, and it basically stayed, actually, they, they both courts, the Exchequer and the court both stayed in Carlo for 30 years, which is quite a long run in those times. Um, it's, it's incredible that, that, you know, what we think of now as a sort of a smaller, no less important, of course, but um, a smaller town in, in Ireland um, has been, for want of a better word, the capital of Ireland. And um, how does that come about? I mean, because Lionel of, of uh, Clark, Duke of Clarence, excuse me, decided it would happen. It's a, it's a really... Uh, it's yeah, it is. I mean, it's, it, it becomes the administrative um, capital of Carlo, which is a difficult one for the tourism board to sell because administrative <laughs> capitals never really um, you know, gather much attention. Um, but, you know, it, it is, you know, when you look at it, and it I found a record of, you know, roughly the, the occupants in 1362. There was the sheriff, a couple of lawyers, the chief sergeant, a whole bunch of money collectors. Uh, and clerks, uh, and a garrison that was a constable, a man at arms, and probably eight archers. So that's, you know, what the occupants were at that time. And, uh, you know, it must have peaked during the 1360s. I mean, uh, when the king, the king of England's son is in charge, you know, that's a, that's a big gig. And do we know much about Lionel, what he, what, what his, uh, what he looked like, or what he, what, how he acted with around the Irish? I know we know <laughs> from his uh, statutes of Kilkenny how he felt towards the Normans becoming more Irish, but what was he? What was he like? Do we know? No, I don't. I I haven't got into that. Maybe maybe that detail is out there. I couldn't really find very much. He was very young. He was only well. They were, everybody's very young, but he was like twenty three. Um, you know, when he when he arrived um, as governor of Ireland, which is you know very young indeed. But yeah, as you say, he hosts the the Irish Parliament in Kilkenny in Kilkenny Castle, there where the statutes of um, of Kilkenny are passed, and that's all about stopping people from going native. So I can't imagine he was very fond of the Irish. Um, uh, in that regard, he's trying to ban everything. You're not allowed, you know, use Irish language, Irish dress, you can't have Irish names, you're not allowed to intermarry with Irish, no hurling, no minstrels, no harp music. No, I don't think he would have been very keen on them. Um, anyway, uh, it, uh, as it turned out, you know, quite a lot of the statues were unenforceable uh, or people didn't bother and he, he eventually, but not eventually, he left in a half in 1367 and skedaddled onwards uh, to marry. And he ends up with a bit of a, sorry, I know it's an awful cliche to keep saying Game of Thrones, but it's, you know, you can see where these stories come from. He goes off and marries um, a daughter of um, Galeazzo Visconti, who's the, um, the uh, is he the Duke of Milan? And he's, he's in charge of Milan anyway. Uh, and uh, then he mysteriously dies a few months later, poisoned um, quite probably by his father-in-law. So. <laughs> these are the stories. These are the stories, and I, I do. And just on that note, I mean, I, I've read the, uh, the one of the Game of Thrones books, and I, I feel that there is definitely something that has been taken from Irish history. There are too many overlapping features of of the novels that I can only put down to things that have happened. You know, these Blim and Fitzgeralds going out about their business, and you know, the Burks getting up to nastiness over in the uh, the other side of the Shannon. And it, it, to me, it can only have been taken by or have been read for by somebody who knows something about Irish history and uh, ends up in a fantasy novel. But um, yeah. I, well, this is, this is my question. I mean, do you have a favorite story of the, your forgotten history of Ireland? Uh, you know, which is your favorite piece of Ireland's forgotten past that you managed to put in this book? Gosh, um, so I To put you on the spot. <laughs> put me on the spot. Um, no, I, I'm just trying to think. I just, I mean, I love, you know, because I live in the locality, it's really trying to find stories about the area that I, I like. Well, in fact, I mean, I, you know, even going back to Carlo Castle, because that is close to me, I did love 
um, because I've always known about the castle and then I read about this, uh, this doctor who'd apparently destroyed it, but it didn't, there was no details about him at all. And I definitely, uh, I did a project with um, Carlo uh, County Council a few years ago and I was, they asked me to write a book about Carlo Castle. So it was a good excuse to get stuck in and dive in, particularly into um, Philip Parry Price Middleton, who is this loony doctor um, that uh, basically buys Carlo Castle long centuries after all of you know, Prince Lionel and all that. It survived uh, two sieges by Cromwell and uh, an artillery bombardment and all that. And it was, you know, pretty redundant, but it was still had four walls, four towers. Mm. Um, anyway, this doctor buys it um, and he wants to turn it into um, a maison de santé, which is uh, another word for a lunatic asylum, uh, as they called them in those days. Um, and uh, he wanted to widen the windows, um, so he put blasting powder around the windows early one Sunday morning and lit it with his Maguire and Patterson match, whatever he had, and boom, woke up everybody in Leinster. Uh, amazingly, nobody died, but uh, two of the towers fell down and, and uh, three of the walls. So that was the end of the castle. But uh, even looking up him, and he was, you know, he was a fascinating guy. He had links in Philadelphia. He was involved in a very lurid sex scandal um, just after this uh, incident with the castle that was printed in salacious detail in all the press at the time. Was uh, They're all, you know, hor we are horrified to report the following, which they then reported in <laughs> by bloody detail. Um, and, uh, you know, he had, a, he had a lot of things going on. So I don't know. I think it's, you know, I think it's the point that, you know, within the walls of nearly every building, you're going to get a character like that. He's got, you know, stories to tell. <laughs> it's, it's a wonderful one. It really is. And a surprising amount of uh, buildings. And I, I think it was it Nina Castle. I think it might have been Nina was blown up in similar by a, perhaps a farmer, not a, when you say a loony doctor, is he the loony or <laughs> anyway, he, uh, I, I think he blew up one as well uh, to scare the pigeons away and decided to use, you know, TNT for that job. Um, so, uh, yeah, as, as you say, characters, uh, I think the world over, they know that characters come from Carlo and Tip Tipperary anyway, so. Um, well, that's it. It's, uh, I mean, I think, uh, Oliver Cromwell didn't have um, blasting powder on, as well as everything else. Uh, with, yeah. With the acting left. <laughs> Wouldn't be a thing left. Um, yeah, well, in between times, and again, another thing that we were, again, you know, we're talking about these, these, these characters, and um, in chapter 15, there was, a, there, was a, there was a chat about a certain bad bunch of butlers who uh, decided to take on the Earls of Kildare and Desmond and during the Wars of the Roses and chose the, the bad, mad uh, Lancastrians. Hmm. Now, um, these butlers you speak of, you're half a one, I'm hopefully one. Um, are they really that bad? Or they, they seem to be bad the world over. <laughs> <laughs> ah, the butlers. No, they weren't that bad. I don't know. Some were. Some were dreadful and some were, were uh, seemed to be quite noble. But yes, you're dead right. The butlers, um, my mother is a, is a butler and no relation of yours that we know of, but that who knows. Um, but yes, they and their, the head of their family, the Earl of Ormond, they, as you say, lined out for the House of Lancaster going against the House of York, which happened to be the house that the Fitzgeralds went for, because the Fitzgeralds and the butlers being notorious um, sort of enemies. But I hadn't realized really the, le the level of which that enmity really does play out against the Wars of the Roses. I mean, I thought it was a sort of Irish thing, uh, but I didn't realize that that actually translated and it goes over to the big battlefields in England, uh, the Battle of uh, Towton, which is regarded as the bloodiest battle in, in English history. Um, they're both there, and uh, Ormond is uh, captured afterwards and beheaded, and his head is um, put on uh, London Bridge for all to see. Um, and, and that's the that's the, the the battle in 1461, in which 18 year old 18 year old Edward, um, the Duke of York, uh, he's victorious over the Lancastrians, um, and he he ends up being crowned as Edward the Fourth and uh, deposing Henry the Sixth. Um, but so, you, so there's one almond gone, but his brother, for instance, John, who succeeds to the title, but not the lands, because they've had all the lands taken off him. He is, even by his enemy, the new king, Edward IV, uh, declares that he is the goodliest knight he ever beheld and the first gentleman in Christendom. I don't know if he's said that sort of stuff to <laughs> all the people shimmied into his bedchamber, quite possibly. Um, 
but anyway, you have an example of that. And then there's uh, so this guy, John Butler, who, as I say, becomes the next Earl. But then there's another Earl, uh, another brother. So three brothers become Earl of Ormond. And the third one is uh, Thomas, the seventh Earl of Ormond, is also known as the Wool Earl. Um, he's married very successfully, marries this lady who has something like 72 manors, which is, you know, in, in enormous wealth. I mean, unbelievable money. It's like uh, marrying, uh, you know, Amazon uh, these days. Um, and uh, he, you know, he seems to be quite a well-regarded fella, and he is a Lord Chamberlain to Henry VIII's mum, Henry VII's wife, um, Elizabeth of York, who's the sister of the princes in the tower and all that stuff. So he's very close to them. And then he's Lord Chamberlain to Catherine of Aragon too. So, um, you know, big links there, but we're now slowly but surely turning into Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn. It's a, and that yeah. Helps. Uh, and it's an incredible story that we're going from, uh, again, Ireland playing a critical role, really, in, in the, the Wars of the Roses, Perkin Warbeck and Lambert Simnel, of course. And yeah, then... The it's played out in Ireland, yeah. Yeah, uh, and, and it's played out. And then, of course, as you say, you know, these people, you know, marrying into the, the, the Howards and the, uh, the Bolins and giving birth to, uh, to, to uh, Anne Boleyn. And obviously her story is quite critical as well. Well, I mean, it is. I mean, when um, that... The, the Wool Earl of Ormond, who I was just talking about, you know, when he um, was, uh, di he died in 1515 and he left uh, this sort of gold and ivory drinking hoard that I'm longing to track down because it was described as ancient even then. So God knows how long it was. And he leaves it to his grandson, who is Thomas Boleyn. Um, and this is Anne Boleyn's dad. Um, and you know, there's who and Thomas Boleyn is briefly becomes the Earl of Ormond when he's in Henry VIII's good books, but after Anne's fall from power and being beheaded, it's sort of removed from him and given back to the butlers and you know, remains on there uh, with them and right through to the 20th century. But uh, yeah, this story, I mean, it was full of hope that you know, we could prove that Anne was born in Carrick on Shore where her grandparents lived in Ormond Castle, as it was called, but uh, there is no evidence, sadly. It's, it's, it's one of those ones that we, somewhere down the line we're talking about, uh, you know, the Blackpool of, of Dublin becoming a, a major incident, perhaps somewhere down the line. Yeah. We'll find the, the connection. But um, yes, I, I mean, I hope that sort of shows just how many stories and vignettes into Irish history. And uh, I mean, you're, you're dropped into it. This is a, for me, I mean, I read this in about a day. Uh, I suspect that some people will have a little chapter here and a little chapter there. I mean, is it, is it that sort of book that you were looking for when you, when you started writing that little you know, here's a little, drop you into a little era and have a little... Yeah, no, I always, I always like to, I mean, okay, every now and then I write a, you know, a long, long story, but I always quite like the stories to be reasonably short that you can read in a bathtub. It's meant to be a one, one bath, one read, uh, without the water getting too cold around you. Um, and uh, I just, you know, I think that's the thing. And, um, you know, people don't necessarily have... Uh, the interest or the intention span, including me, I'd say, to, you know, to, for, for long... Uh, accounts of these things but so it ends up being kind of some a little bit pop history sometimes because I'm not going to go into great depths um, but it is I mean I, I do quite like getting a complicated uh, event like Ireland and the Wars of the Roses or whatever um, and trying to sort of translate it and boil it down to being a sort of 1600 words 2000 words perhaps you know, summary of it all that makes sense. Um, I get quite a kick out of it if I can achieve that, because then it makes sense to me for starters. Um, well, I can I can positively say that you've got this. This is just another little look at the book, and it's uh, available in all good bookshops, and even some poor ones, I would imagine too, because they need to have it. But it's uh, it's a it's a really lovely book, and I, I've got to say, I must. It's it's up there. I love uh, 1847 as well, but this is something I just really felt at home with. So congratulations on another great uh, product. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Butler. I'm <laughs> very pleased um, to hear your verdict of it. So, uh, Turtle, thank you very much for appearing. I will um, just say cheerio to everybody watching. We'll have a little chat afterwards.